and welcome to Wild for Scotland, a podcast full of inspiring stories from Scotland. I'm your host, Cathy Camleitner. Wild for Scotland helps you connect with Scotland and dream about future adventures. I'll tell you immersive stories to whisk you away, share some of my top tips for your own Scotland trip, and introduce you to inspiring locals and their stories. So lean back and enjoy. Let's travel to Scotland. Today I'm taking you back to Kilmartin Glen, that historic gem in the heart of Argyll. In the middle of our tour, I sat down with our guide, Heather Thomas-Smith, to ask her all about her story. We talk about what brought her to Argyll and her journey as a mountain leader, what fascinates her the most about the historic sites in Kilmartin, and how she approaches the mysteries of the past. But I also wanted to ask her what she would want people to know about these places. Historic sites, especially these ancient ones with very few visible remains, can often blend into the scenery. When there's not much to see, people tend not to be all that interested. I'll include myself in that. At least until fairly recently, when tours like our walks with Kirsty and Heather started opening my eyes to the stories behind the rubble. So let's hear it from Heather Thomas-Smith and our chat about Scottish history in Argyll. Do you want to start off by introducing yourself, telling us your preferred pronouns and a little bit about what you do? Yeah. So, hi. Um, yeah, I'm Heather Thomas-Smith. Um, you can call me she or her. And I run a little company called Heathery Heights based in Loch Gilped. So that's in the heart of Argyll, a really beautiful part of Scotland. And in fact, considered the original part of Argyll. The company came up here in 2019, so I was based down in the Yorkshire Dales, where I'd been working for 20-odd years, and moved back up here to be actually close to my mother. So 2019 saw the return of Heathery Heights to Argyll just in time for COVID. So this has been an actually really interesting time, because what we really wanted to do was open up experiences in the outdoors for people from walking to foraging to just finding out what actually is in this beautiful part of the world because the geology, geography and history is outstanding, as is the coast. So that's really what we're here to do, take people out into the outdoors for an adventure. And is that something you were always really keen on and something you've always done? In yes. Your life? Yes. I mean, it's 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 weird because mum and dad loved being in the outdoors. They were sailors, um, so I was brought up in Tarbot originally. You wouldn't believe that from my accent. I know. Um, maybe that's from going to boarding school and living in England, and I hate to say it, France as well for thirty odd years. But it's it's really about them teaching you from a very early age. I mean, I would be strapped in in a papoose at age three months into a yacht sailing around the Hebrides. We were off in the boat in the dinghy. We were learning to swim in the sea. There was no, you know, everything was done in the sea or naturally. You, you had to go fishing. You had to go and collect things to eat. Every island we went to, we had to get to the top of it. You know, that was that was the norm. Um, we used to be able to anchor in places like Loch Karusk on Sky, and so the hills there you'd be, or well, not at Loch Karusk and Loch Skavig, but you could walk up to Loch Karusk and then go scrambling up onto the Dew Slabs or onto Skir Um So right at the south end of the Coolin Ridge. So you, it was quite exciting early on going up to Ben A and Loch Torridon and Sky, the southern part even was really interesting. But the northern cliffs of Sky, as you go out across to the Outer Hebrides, you know, you see these huge cliffs as you're going out from Neast Point and so on. So really quite exciting for a child. And that was what I was brought up with. And Dad was in the forestry, so that really meant you're in the outdoors. Then I went to a school where the outdoors was part of what we do. 
And so from age eight, I was sent away. Um, it sounds quite harsh, <laughs> but there you go, age eight, <laughs> 10 years at boarding school. And that meant we were very much in an outdoor environment, learning expeditions, training and self-survival. Uh, I think the first self-survival expedition I went on, I was age 12 when we went around Cape Roth and were given some bread, sandwich bread and a few baked beans and told to go and hunt, basically. And we were eating, you wouldn't do this now, this is 1979-ish, just before the wildlife and Countryside Act came in 81, eating guillemot, seagull, rabbit, cockles, winkles, wiggle ice, which were disgusting, um, and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. But we were being taught to actually survive ourselves so yeah it was instilled in me and then I ended up in the mountain rescue in the Cairngorms back in the mid 1980s ran the fell walking club as a student so I was down in Oxfordshire so I used to take people to Wales to the Lake District and occasionally back up to Scotland and then it sort of became that it was that hobby if you like throughout the rest of my life I went into hospitality I lectured in human resources, I've worked for a publisher, I've done quite a few things in my life, but the outdoors was always there. Uh, so, which is why I sort of opened up Heathery Heights a few years ago, really when my daughter was old enough. So, she would have been about nine years old. So, that's how it all started. <laughs> that's absolutely fascinating. That's That doesn't sound like the kind of boarding school I think of when I hear boarding school, you know, it, it feels like that should be more sheltered and more like, I don't know, strict and very academic. But that just sounds amazing <laughs> and also a bit ridiculous, like crazy, absolutely crazy to put kids out into the wild and say. So, yes, we actually ended up, it was very much an outdoor school. So it was a, opened up by a German a Jew called Kurt Hahn, who escaped after the war, or during the war really, over to Britain. And he actually founded the school I went to where there were outdoor activities, including having to be in a service, which is why I ended up doing mountain rescue then, and then actually mountain rescue again when I was in the Yorkshire Dales. But you had to do something, whether it was community service or joining the Air Training Corps or Surf Life Rescue, Coast Guards. So you were expected to give something back to the community and train. And you had to train for two years before you were actually allowed to become a full-time member. Sadly, the mountain rescue side, they actually stopped doing in later years. I sp suspect it was age. You know, we were learning to do these things when we were quite young and they may not be able to do that now, perhaps. But they still have a fire service and so on there. So I think the expeditions were a really good part as well because you're out in the Cairngorms on a regular basis and we were left to our own devices to find you know we had to do our own navigation and so on across the hills and um, sometimes it did go wrong and you'd be down the wrong glen and the teacher would be very very cross that they'd have to drive 40 miles around to pick you up <laughs> <laughs> maybe more <laughs> so well, it, yeah yeah that's, so. the, that's the risk of it isn't it if you let kids wander off into the wilderness on their yeah. own <laughs> But, you know, Go I think it was the consequences. <laughs> experiences then that, yeah, there still are the same kind of experiences, but that's how DOV was formed. So Duke of Edinburgh expeditions mm. were basically came out of what we were doing at that school. Um, yeah. And that's where, because that's where Prince Philip went to school. So That's really cool. And so what was it like then to turn that hobby or that passion thing that you did in your spare time into a business and into something you did for your for your living, so to say? It really came from volunteering and this was going back to when my daughter was growing up and initially joined Rainbows and then Brownies. And um, I thought, oh, you know, why don't you join Scouts? Um, I shouldn't say that now because I, I do work with girl guiding. But at the time, I was like, why don't you join Scouts? But anyway, she didn't. She joined Brownies and I thought, well, they're not doing so much in the outdoors. Maybe I could help out. So... I got sucked in by saying, mm, I can help take the girls out and let's go and do some walks. Uh, maybe we could do a bit of camping. Ah, oh, yes, you great. But to do that, you have to be a brownie leader. Right. So then you go through that side of it. So I became a brownie leader. Then, you know, take them out on camp um, and do DV, become a DV supervisor, become DV assessor. <laughs> and so the list goes on. So you find yourself being pulled in doing that. But to be fair... Girl guiding actually paid for me to become a mountain leader so that I could actually help take the girls out. So I really went into it as a volunteer initially. And then it was other local businesses that start, started asking me, well, could you help lead a walk? And it could be for a group on holiday or it might have been Yorkshire Three Peaks. Um, I live very near 
the Yorkshire Three Peaks at the time as I was near Settle. So I was drawn in, if you like, because it was my hobby and I had done a lot of Monroes and I had walked across Scotland and travelled to the Himalayas and Andes and things in my lifetime. So it was down to knowing people who were interested in what I was up to as a volunteer, thinking, well, can you not come and do that for us and actually work? And then you're working for somebody else's subcontractor, but you're thinking, well, maybe I could set this up as a business myself. And that's how it happened. So I was still working with the publishers, actually, in a little place called Long Preston. So it was a large print books company, Magna Print, who no longer exists, sadly, in that part of the world anyway. But it just gave me an opportunity to sort of bounce back at them and say, well, can I have some more hours to maybe do some work in the outdoors. And there was a sort of yes from the, the office in Long Preston, but the powers that be in Leicestershire were like, well, no, you're either in or out, <laughs> if you like. So I thought, do I jump ship or not? And that's when I thought, actually, I'm going to set up Heathery Heights just to be my own company, and that's what I will, I'm going to do. So, yeah, that's how it started, really. <laughs> that's so cool. And now you, you say you, you've, you know, you've travelled all over the world, you've been into all these really impressive mountain ranges and yet you find yourself in Argyll which is a beautiful part of Scotland don't get me wrong I do love it but the mountains aren't quite on the same level (laughs) even as the northern highlands but then particularly compared to those mountain ranges um what I know you said it was family reasons that pulled you back particularly but also I'm sure the landscape had something to do with it kind of what what pulled you back to this part of Scotland and made you wanting to to do what you do here really geologically and geographically you have a very varied landscape and I also studied geology ironically if I go back a step I was going to go to King's College in London to do a geology degree careers advice said that I'd probably be stuck in an office I don't like that side of it so I ended up in hospitality and nutrition completely different because I used to work on the Vic 32 so I thought wow catering I'll do that instead But that, ironically, is why I didn't do the geology side. But actually, this area, the geology, is fascinating. And if you look at how the landscape was created, I mean, I may be rusty at it now compared to what I would have been then, but it's just fascinating. And the sailing and the kayaking and the swimming and exploring those coasts, it's it's beautiful down by the shore. But actually going up onto the hills themselves and you get these stunning views I mean, you don't have to be going up a Corbett or a Monroe or whatever really to get that. You can go, and this is what I find incredible, is you don't see anybody there and it's beautiful. But I can still go up to Ben Kruken if I wish to in the Arica Alps and I still do go up the Cairngorms. The West Coast itself, though, is what holds it for me. So it is Argyll, but it's that whole West Coast of Scotland. For me, a landscape isn't just about one small pocket. It's a sort of wider range. Um, I mean, I spent my whole childhood going out to the Outer Hebrides so that whole west coast has that draw which I love exploring so it's exploring places you know as well as you don't know it's it's both and sometimes coming back into your what was your backyard as a child you see it with different eyes Mm. because you you may have been at the school thinking oh I don't want to be here or you you know totally different to when you come back and actually see it especially the history which I probably wasn't very interested in when I was five (laughs) (laughs) yeah i think i think contexts become clearer as we get older and as we maybe see the same landscapes over and over again i think it is interesting to then uncover and reveal more and more layers of a place and not just look at oh this is pretty then you actually think of of like why does it look that way and what made this look that way and, and what geological events went into all of this and then peeling back another layer like you see and Thinking yeah, about it's the people like peeling who an onion, it. isn't it? You yeah. are you keep going deeper into each layer, and it could be about the peoples that lived here. It could be anything from I mean, it could be the mining, um, the fishing industry, the fact they used to keep horses down on Kintyre. I mean, you start looking back at what's this, what's happened in this area, and and the clearances, and it's really varied. But you also look at the geology and the geography of the area, and why it was so popular with seagoing vessels. I mean, it is very much an area for boats to come mm-hmm. up. and I mean, it's the easiest way to travel and was for many, many years. You know, the main roads weren't really built, put into the 1940s. So it's like peeling back layers. And is that something, I imagine that's something that goes into your guided walks as well. And 
it's not just about the scenery, is it? No. I mean, you are obviously going out there usually with some form of goal. It could be uh, history, could be geology, it could be foraging, it could be all of those things. It really depends on what the person wants to see that comes out. But often you are talking about what's there as you see it anyway. That is just how it comes to you naturally. And as much as you can, you will explain that environment. And and it can be really exciting. You know, you start getting into stuff. And especially if you find, well, it's like with plants, sometimes you'll know what it's like with foraging. You can get really into something and you taste it and you think, oh, yeah, now what else can we find? And you get sucked in. But it's the same with the history. You You could be going down into the woods to try and find an old village that hasn't been looked at for years there may be trees growing out of it and actually trying to find that on a map and get to it's fantastic but then you can show it to somebody and that's quite exciting because you know hardly anyone ever goes there in fact the chances of seeing somebody are zero in many cases and that's exciting for them too because they're like oh nobody else comes here you know so it's finding those little special places but trying to find out the history of some of these places is also really difficult because the records aren't always there or they're not easy to find So I've gone into a couple of old settlements recently where it's like um, there's one near Lot Gilpet Upper Akna Bar. And okay, there was a community that lived there. There's a lovely old Drover's Bridge. There's some quarry below, but I can't find out much about it really. You know, it's like probably have to go back into the records, you know, somewhere and and get into the archives to find the right information. There will be information, but it's not easily found. You could Google it. You won't find anything. So how do you go about kind of preparing the information that you then pass on to to clients and to, to visitors, to other people? Sometimes it's just through books. It could be, I mean, there's some very good historians out there and there are really good books. So Ian Bradley's written about Argyle and the spiritual landscape. Then you'll have Sharon Webb's book In the Footstep of Kings. Those kind of books are really useful. They have good information. You could, the museum, of course, when it's open again, is and it has been obviously in the past, is a really good resource. And they have good resources as well. So when you're trying to find information, especially about these sites, it's worth looking on those. Speaking to local peoples, I mean, there's an archaeological group in the area. Sadly, because of COVID, I've only been to one of their talks um, since I moved up here, but that's the sort of thing you can Mm. do. You can get along to a talk or go on one of their walks. Then you have people that are historians and archaeologists who know, you know, that's what they specialise in. So that's another way of learning. And every time you do that, you're picking up a little bit more. And sometimes you forget it because, you know, it's very broad when you look at everything, you know, from the geography to the geology to the flora, the fauna, the history. There's a lot there. But you are trying to pick out the best so that your clients get that chance to see what's here and, and learn a bit about this landscape. Well, and all these things are connected as well. So on our, on our walk through Kilmartin Glen today, you know, you, we eventually talked about foraging as well because that is part of the story of the people who lived here and the monuments that they left behind and that were discovered by, you know, many, many, many generations later. So all these things are connected. You cannot just look at a historic monument without thinking about what did it look like back then? What did they eat? What kept them in this area? What might exchange with other communities or other cultures might have looked like and things like that? That's what I found so fascinating about our walk today. Yes, I mean, it's certainly very much that line of of thought with um, the history of that person. And as you say, why did they settle there? What made them stay? So it is also the, the, the that narrative, isn't it, where how does that family survive? Um, what what is their right? What well, we still don't understand their rituals and some why they have them, but they stayed in this landscape presumably because it was rich. It must have been rich, and the food sources must have been good because otherwise they would have moved on in that nomadic lifestyle. They wouldn't have stayed here. Mm-hmm. Um, but then that sort of gap where there does seem to be less about known about the a- area, maybe people were moving on and fighting because there was a lack of or less food anyway, because the climate changed. So I, I think it's fascinating and we don't always know the full story. The story has always been a little bit more has been uncovered every year as they find more. And we start to look back in in time further and further now. And, and I think it's incredible what can be worked out, whether it's geological time or historical from the point of view of the human being. But yeah, it is. It's fascinating trying to work out the whole picture 
as how that person or peoples would have lived and the animals that lived here and other species. It's not just about people. Um, you know, the fact that there were lynx and the fact there were bear and wolves, you know, we forget sometimes that these other creatures shared these woods and uh, we'd be walking with those animals. <laughs> Yeah, and so for listeners who haven't listened to last week's episode, obviously if you have, you already know a little bit more about Kilmartin Glen and our walk with Heather. But we are now actually going to listen to a short clip from our walk in Kilmartin Glen and give you a taste of what that's like. Inside, which are really important old Celtic crosses. Um, and here comes the rain, <laughs> just in time. No. <laughs> well, it looks like it won't stay though. <laughs> I think we'll have showery days today. So it does tell you a little bit on here, but not so much. But what you'll notice is that it's a glaciated landscape, um, the very flat valley bottom. So the glaciers themselves would have eroded a lot of this landscape out, but that went on till about 10,000 years ago. And there's not really any evidence of man before that time. And the end of the last age, ice age would have been 8,000 years ago. And you do see some sites up around Oban that they have excavated and so on. They have found remains going back as, late, as mm. early as that, I should say. But then you find here that the first real signs of man are probably around the five and a half thousand years ago that mark 6,000 yeah. years ago. So that is where you get the 6,000 years, yeah. a changeover where we're now actually finding man. But they could well have been here before that because you have to remember the oceans have changed dramatically in, in depth. And there are times when we almost had a bit of a land bridge going over to Europe. So people would have been able to come through. Mm -hmm. And also even during the late uh, or the dying stages of the ice age, I suppose, they would have been the hunters coming up mm -hmm. into areas and perhaps retreating again. Um, yeah. So following bison or um, mammoths or whatever, you know, but they would have been following animals back and forth. And they may not have actually stayed in the area until that milder climate started. And there's been sort of mini cold periods, you know, since. But what's effectively happened is 6,000 years ago, people came here and would have found enough food to live on. And by then, of course, people were already starting to have flocks of sheep and, you know, they were managing animals, but they weren't really settling down till that period with arable farming. It was quite nomadic still in many cases, or they may have had a settlement inland or in a settlement at the coast that they'd go between fishing. Um, you, you know from yourself, from having done a foraging course, that it's often about what plants are available throughout mm -hmm. the time of year, but also what animals. And the landscape would have been wooded in many cases for man then. It would have been your hawthorn and your oak your older and your rowan trees and so on. And that also meant within that there's animals living here that don't live here anymore, whether it be lynx or wolf or bear. So there was animals to hunt. And you had a rich fish stock, far richer than we <laughs> have now. Um, but the, uh, the berries, the nuts, you know, they were all there. So this would have been a good place to come to. And the climate was good. But about 3,000 years ago, it started to get a lot wetter. So you find that that period between 6,000 and 3,000 years ago, they obviously used this landscape and in a very much a rightful manner, which we'll talk a bit about in a minute. But after that period, it seems to become less used and certainly not used in the sense of rightful landscape. It mm. became more warlords and people perhaps scrabbling for their patch of land. But of course you were going into the Iron Age. So weaponry. So it changed how man saw the landscape and used the landscape. Um, and I think that's important because it seems to have been very much a religious area prior to that in their own beliefs. And looking at celestial heavens um, and trying to understand, you know, the world and the stars around them. But also where they had important burials of their, their you know, the chiefs and so on. And they obviously had a, um, they held them in great importance, the fact they were then building what we now see in this valley as a linear cemetery. So yes, it's very interesting to see it from a perspective of what did they find here? Why did they find it good? It, the climate was good. So therefore it was rich in, in many species. And if you look at pollen, they have areas where they've taken obviously pollen and charcoal and data and been able to date it back to 
four or five thousand years ago in some cases. And some of the poems they found going down the west coast um, have been quite similar to what we see today with the ancient woodlands and mm. the heath. You know, so they have had the pollens of the heathland that date four and a half thousand years. Wow. And they have had the pollen of hawthorn and ash and oak. So yeah. we know that some of those species are They're ancient species and they haven't really changed. So <laughs> we'll leave it at that point here and make our way to the church just to go jump forward in history for a few minutes. <laughs> Amazing. What a beautiful view as well. Now, let's take a quick detour and hear a story about our sponsors. Hello, Wild for Scotland listeners. I am Fran Tarowskis, and if you enjoy the storytelling episodes of Wild for Scotland, I want to tell you about another podcast in the Trembula Network. Seize Your Adventure is for people who want to explore the whole spectrum of adventure, from life-changing journeys and extreme challenges to the smaller moments spent outside. But Seize Your Adventure is more than an adventure sports podcast because all of the guests and storytellers throughout the series live the adventure lifestyle whilst also living with epilepsy. You'll get to hear stories about long distance hiking, skiing in snowstorms and camping under the stars. But there are interviews that dive into the deeper stuff too, the hidden aspects of taking on adventures with epilepsy. So if you're after a podcast that inspires, entertains and encourages you to take part in the adventure lifestyle, then search for Seize Your Adventure in your podcast app or head to seizeyouradventure.com to find out more. I'd really love to ask you about kind of the expectations that people bring with them when they get in touch with you or maybe even, you know, how they find you in the first place and what they're looking for, what they say they're looking for and then how that kind of compares with their actual experiences here in Argyll and and on a walk with you. Sometimes they will find me, obviously, through my website, but it's also through word of mouth or perhaps they've heard of me through travel trade or previous people that have come on holidays where I guided elsewhere in the UK may have just come across my name again because I do walks throughout the UK as well as in Scotland. So that helps, you know, those connections come. I I found quite interestingly that I've had several American groups contacting me now and they I've presumably found me through my website, but it's quite strange because you're thinking, well, how did they find about out about me anyway? So that's often either word of mouth or through the travel trade, or it could be someone like Wild About Argyle. So those, you know, the sources. The expectations are very varied because I, I suppose you could say I offer quite a wide range of activities. So I've had clients in the past who've wanted challenge walks. So that's very different to the history. Mm. So they'll be looking at X many summits perhaps in so many hours. It's very different. But then I'll have had people who are thinking, okay, she's obviously based in Kilmartin area. She obviously is interested in the history there and has written a little bit about it. So we'll see what she could cr- compile for us as a bespoke experience. So that's it's often a bespoke experience in that case. And it may not be structured specifically because they may leave it very open book to me and time, or they may say, actually, this is the site I want to see, and it is very structured. Um, that's then, basically, I'll then put an itinerary together as much as I can that fits that time scale, if you like, and how much they want to go into the depth of the history maybe depends on what they know or what they don't know. Sometimes you may find you have a specialist who has probably learned more than you through reading lots and lots of books, but they haven't seen the sites in person and just want you to take them to the stones and, and, and see it for themselves. And in fact, I've had an American couple, you know, who are obviously very, very knowledgeable and she had done a lot of research um, and for many years as well, you know, but she had never been and, and that was uh, really important. So, that's how it can tail out. Um, when it becomes some of the other experiences like foraging and so on, it's then it could be locals, it could be visitors, it could be both. And I think that's more about people learning something in the backyards too, where they're thinking, oh, we didn't know we could do this here and, and or that it existed. So, yeah, different people with different expectations. I haven't luckily had too many expecting 
grandeur and so on in a sense that it's um what you might think of as Disney castles, but you know, where it can be built up and their expectations are then shattered when they just see one small rock. Because you people that come to Argyle tend to already have an understanding that you are looking at the old and the ancient in many cases and that the remains won't be of that state. You know, they're not huge, but they are very interesting. And Many people that come to Argyll know Scotland quite well too. You find that as well. So they're almost coming to an area they haven't had a chance to explore. And we're not a tick list, but it's somewhere else they haven't yet been to. Mm. So it may not have been their first choice. They may have been to Edinburgh. They may have been to the Cairngorms. They may have been to Skye. They may have even been on the North 500. But Argyll's like somewhere undiscovered for many, which is interesting as it's such a big county. (laughs) And also it's so close. I, so I live in Glasgow and it's a two hour drive for me to get to Kilmartin Glen and it takes so much longer to get to some of those more iconic sites. I love coming to Argyle. I've been to Argyle many times. The Isles are obviously part of the council areas or the council region as well. So that helps. So <laughs> even more trips to Argyle if you count the islands in as well. But it's such. I'm always so happy when I have a reader or a follower or a listener who tells me they've been to Argyle because they've listened to some of my stuff or read some of my blog posts and that made them choose it. Because it is a little bit of an underappreciated or underexplored part of Scotland that is a bit off the beaten track, a bit of a hidden gem. The people who know about it love it, usually, because they understand how rich it is. But it is sometimes, I think it takes a little bit extra convincing to get people to really appreciate it and, and try yeah. it. It hasn't been marketed simply in the same way over the years. And not just that, it's um, sometimes it's down to film and so on, you know. So was it was Harry Potter f- filmed here? And, and this kind of thing, well, no. Um, you know, and, and if it's not in an advert or a James Bond movie, well, actually, that's not quite so true now because we know that, of course, over at Crinan, if you go over to Duntroon Castle, the iconic gates there were used as an idea. Um, but the that is something that people are often looking for. And that's not necessarily what we do here. This is about really getting in touch with the landscape. And maybe that may attract the more mature tourist uh, in some ways, or someone that is wanting to really explore the heart of a country and get in, get to know it well, rather than just a quick bus trip around to, to pick a tick off you know, the main sites. That is the difference. Um, and yet we have so many castles. I mean, Castle Sween's one of the oldest castles in Scotland, in fact, in Britain. But, you know, it, it, that, that's what I find quite odd is that we have a lot of firsts mm-hmm. and a lot of things here that we don't. there isn't anything else like it in the country. But people whiz up to sky and, and so on. And they forget that we have this amazing county here. But maybe public transport and infrastructure can actually slow things down because we don't necessarily have the big hotels. And actually, importantly, we don't have a train journey through this part of Argyle. There's no train station here. You have to go to Oban. But that actually will hold people back sometimes too. So I think infrastructure, you know, people will have to drive here or use a bus or cycle, which is even better. Yeah. Um, I cycled part of the Caledonia Way earlier this year. It wasn't the the southern part on the Kintyre Peninsula, but I, I do have the plan to do that one day as well, because I think it's such a beautiful landscape to explore. What I love about this part of Argyle particularly, and it refers back to that kind of geological process or the you know that that shaped this this land, is there's always water nearby. Yes, you're on the mainland, but it doesn't feel like it because if you're on a higher ground, you can see the water in all directions and it feels like you're supposed to be on an island, you know, Um, but you're still on the mainland. And that's something I love about this part of Argyll, particularly this kind of the heart of Argyll region. Um, Do you have a favourite thing about this area of Argyll or Argyll in general? I love Argyll in general, general, but I actually... I mean, I do like the hills and the naps and this is really interesting part of the world where you have geology that draws your eye in. My mother's an artist and she captures that so well sometimes in her paintings and especially on the coasts as well and all the way down to Macri Hanish. But 
it's just so knobbly and gnarly. It makes it really interesting. And, you know, you could imagine all these sleeping dragons and lizards and everything else lying there because of the, the, the na- nature of the rock from the northeast to the southwest. You can just imagine lots of sleeping dragons, you know, with locks around them. And it's very field like. But I mean, you're saying about it being a bit like islands. I mean, I was walking across Scotland this year and my journey took me from Tarba over to Port of Ardy, and then I was walking from there, but I was using part of the Cow Way, and that was interesting because I didn't really leave Argyle or the sea until, of course, I'd gone over from Arica. Mm. And so I was back and forth, still seeing the sea, and I was thinking, oh, I've been walking for a while, you know, I'm still on the west coast, I'm actually walking to the east coast. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you're used there. But we've got 3,000 miles of coastline in Argyle, which is the same as France. I mean, people forget that. Yeah. It's incredible. And yeah, it's it's. I just think it's amazing, and all these lochens and lochs as well. These little patches of water. You can go up a hill somewhere, and there's a little loch, and you can maybe go for a swim, or just enjoy the view and a lovely balmy day. And okay, we do get midges, and they can be a pain, but actually this year not so bad. Not you know we haven't had that many at all, and we do have means of dealing with them. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ideally, just standing next to me. <laughs> that works. <laughs> <laughs> they do love me. Um, I always try and stand next to someone who says the same thing and they still go for me. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a good magnet. <laughs> so get lots of bog myrtle and rub it into your skin. Actually, mm. bog myrtle is supposed to repel them really well, but um, I've not yet had that much success. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard as well. Tony, who is uh, our guide in the episode Wild Isle about the Isle of Mull, was also talking about bog myrtle as a natural midge defensive uh, I don't know he might have just made it up <laughs> uh, yeah. I think it, it does have something there but you need a lot and uh, maybe just eat a little more garlic as well <laughs> <laughs> another thing that I find really fascinating about, about Kilmartin Glen particularly and all the historic sites around here is that they really help you develop an understanding of people's relationship with the land and the marks they left on it and and their lives really even though of course we don't understand so much about the why and what exactly but can see what they've left behind are there any parts of that kind of human history of the glen that you're particularly drawn to i mean the actual cup and ring marks in themselves are fascinating we don't really know what they mean and that's actually what's so amazing about them and these go back five thousand years and you think how how did those people sort of come up to these areas and to this often volcanic uh, little intrusions of rock and decide that I'm going to start carving out these stones? They must have been living fairly close by to do that. Um, but there are so many of them. I mean, as we saw at Acne Breck, there's one with over 80-odd marks. And they are on sloping rocks. And, and we know that they could be astrological. They could be looking at the landscape and trying to mark out the landscape. They they could be sacrificial, although I don't personally believe that. But it leaves you wondering at the people and why they made these marks. But it also takes me back to thinking about the climate at the time and the wealth that must have been here with food sources must have been quite rich in that they had the time to make those marks rather than worrying about fighting with each other. So, yeah, it, it, I'm trying to imagine a man sitting there with his quartz hammer making these cup and ring marks, all these rings, and, and they're very exact rings. You know, they were very careful to, to keep them in good proportion. What were they thinking? What were they doing? Or was it a ritual in itself, actually, the carving process? Almost like a sort of form of meditation. That's mm. something else you sometimes wonder. But... And you look at the standing stones, which are more recent, so three and a half thousand years ago or so, and sometimes the rocks themselves have then got cup marks or ring marks in them, so they've probably been moved. You then think, well, that has to be surely more to do with our astrological cycles, our solstices, because of the alignment, um, very much in line with the midwinter sunrise and sunset and moonrise and so on. And yeah, it, it I, I don't see what other reason they'd be there for. So more of a ritualistic meaning for those in a different sense, maybe to do with burials or maybe just to do with the changes of season, but very important to the people that lived here. And we see this right through from Orkney all the way down to Stonehenge and wander at them. But 
we don't know enough. And, and we could say that for all these ancient sites. We just wonder what those rituals meant to people. But we do know that the sun and the moon were very important. Yeah. And what is so fascinating about that is that then you've got those sites where you know parts of it are five and a half thousand years old, but then other parts of it have been added 2,000 years later. So people must have had some idea of what it might have meant or at least had the confidence to add something to it and and now we are asking those same questions almost potentially yeah i mean i think when you look at um, not so much at the standing stones i mean obviously we saw at temple woods we have the stone circle there the older one where it was originally wooden timbers and then the newer circle so the older one going four and a half thousand to five thousand years or whatever back but then the newer circle at the south but then you have the cairn and you think, well, there's an example of something that was 5,600 5, years, followed by people coming along a thousand years later and adding all the stones. So it form, formed part of the cemetery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you're right, sort of. But then it must have always had that meaning for them spiritually and as a burial site. Mm. And that just must have continued down the generations. And then it was used in a different way. Yeah, it makes you wonder where that point was, where that knowledge got lost. Right, because maybe those people still knew what it was three thousand years ago, but yes. then at some point there was a a moment in time when that knowledge got lost. It wasn't passed down any longer, and we now are in the dark. Really, I, I think this goes back to climate and and changes in climate may have made may have made people move on slightly. I mean, we know it got wetter and that, that there was that peat and in, the increase in the peat in the area meant the land wasn't being used in the same way, and that the peat actually covered the cairns and the standing stones I find I still find incredible but it means that they must have moved out of that area to a degree um, and onto the duns and the forts and the higher land mm. um, it was wet um, and we do have to remember it was very wet and it's very, and peat's pretty acidic because you can't do much with it and it wasn't until much later when they started building lime kilns and using lime to sweeten it again that you have the pasture mm. and obviously they'd cut away a lot of the peat but yeah, there is a section where you think, well, what happened? Um, but we do know, of course, that they were starting to fight more. And, and that's sad, but that could have been due to food shortages or just more people. That comes back to territory. <laughs> um, and we know that they'd moved into that stage of Iron Age, which is, I think, an important aspect to that. Mm. What would be your advice for someone who wants to come and visit Argyle to really kind of get the most out of their time here? I would certainly recommend spending at least a couple of days in the Kilmartin area because there is so much to see. And, you know, you could go for just a single nice walk out to Ormeg where there's some beautiful carvings, but it's the time it takes to walk to some of these places. And then you also can jump through history where you would want to maybe go to Dunad to see the ancient site that they believe was the you know, the centre of the kingdom of Dalrata, where the kings were supposedly inaugurated. And that is really important too. And that would have gone right through from sort of the 600, well, 500, 600, 700 AD. Very important. And then Columba. I mean, he came right through this area too, from Kintyre and northwards, and he would have come up the coast here. So you have this sort of history going right through time from five, six thousand years ago to, you know, Columba's time, the kingdom of Dalriata, and then the clans um, and the Picts, and then actually leading into the Earl of Argyll and the Port Talic estate and Canassary Castle, which was built for the Earl of Argyll and the first translation of the common the book of common prayer by John Craswell Caswell so that i think is really important because there's so much history in a small space that you you couldn't do it in a day you'd need at least a couple of days if not a three or four days you know to to get into into that history and then of course Kilmartin Museum is well worth a visit that could easily take up half a day and I know it's not open till 2023 but the point is it has so much information but very useful place to go as a starting point when it's open because mm. then you get an idea of where to go and when is yeah. the best time to see it yeah any other tips do you want to add anything else it's also about the landscape. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about the history here with sites to see, but actually the coast, it's, it's fascinating as other hills and 
taking time either to bring your own kayak or bike or whatever or going with somebody is well worth it because actually being able to explore the coast close by is really important and and it could be walking along the sea cliffs but equally it could be going along on a kayak trip to explore that because you don't always get to see those cliffs from above you sometimes need to get down there and there are caves where people used to live Mm. you know it's something else we forget that there's some of these places we lived in and there's then you have St Columba's cave and so on or you could go right down to Dunavati and uh, explore that area um and then you've got Mull of Kintyre much further south. So there is an awful lot to explore mm. on foot, which doesn't necessarily mean history. And we can hear buzzards actually where we are now. But you could be seeing the Golden Eagles. You might be going to visit the beavers. Um, and of course, many people don't realise we even have beavers here. Um, but they were introduced here. It's the first place in Scotland in 2009. Um, so they live here in the wild. And there are, you know, they're quite easy to see in an evening, actually, if you know where to go. Um, and you can certainly see their lodges. Um, so there's a lot more to see with wildlife as well. There's porpoise and dolphin off the coast. Um, and there's lots of interesting sea creatures if you go along the shore do a bit of a sea, you know, beach safari and amazing sunsets. And that's something else I will add definitely. Do not miss the sunsets on the West Coast because <laughs> looking over Jura on a clearish evening, just with just enough cloud for that sunset is absolutely amazing. Um, and obviously what's under the water, we're sort of close to the Argyle Hope Spot and, well, part of the, in part of the Argyle Hope Spot too from Loch Sween and that means you get to see this amazing seaweeds and kelps and so on underwater so get your snorkeling gear (laughs) well you don't have to tell me that twice (laughs) but that also brings me to my top tip which is definitely to book a guided walk with Heather because uh, we've had an amazing time and if the story and the interview are anything to go on I think everybody will have an amazing time because you're just such a wealth of information and you know the area so well and you're clearly so passionate about it what is a good way for people to find out more about you maybe get in touch with you book a book a walk with you or even just see what you what you get up to realistically for getting in touch with me they can contact me through heathery heights so there's a contact form there and that's a really useful way but I'm on Facebook and Instagram as well um, or info at heatheryheights.co.uk is just my email, so you can contact me that way. Um, but I'm there on Wild About Argyle and Heart of Argyle and Kintyre 66. You know, you'll you'll find me in there on Wild Scotland as well. So, yeah, I can be contacted through those sources. And, yeah, I'm always there if people want to rig up and chat about what they would like to do. And, and you know, creating a bespoke itinerary is quite often what it's about, not just something that I, I don't put so many on the my actual website you know as to what people can book then and there because i like to keep dates free so we can actually create um an adventure together amazing we'll put all those links in the show notes so it will be very easy for people to get in touch with you and have a similar experience as we did here in kilmartin Glen. thank you so much for taking the time to show us around and to talking to us and sharing your love for argyle with me yeah well thank you very much Uh, it's been a pleasure Thank you so much to Heather Thomas-Smith, not only for taking the time to speak to us about her work and passion for Argyle, but also for taking us round Kilmartin Glen and igniting a new interest and deeper understanding for Scottish history in me. I learned so much on our walk and I can't recommend her guiding services enough. You can connect with Heather on social media at Heathery Heights and find out how to book a walk with her at heatheryheights.co.uk. And if you feel inspired to plan a trip to Kilmartin Glen, don't forget to look up my Heart of Argyle travel guide. You'll find all those links in the full show notes on our website. And with this, I send you off to dream about your own journey back in time. Next week, we're off for our traditional mid-season break. We'll revisit some of our favourite episodes and share some other exciting podcasts to check out on our social media and in our newsletter. Make sure you sign up and follow us there so you don't miss out. We'll be back with a new story the following week, and I can promise you already, it's one you don't want to miss. Thank you so much for listening to Wild for Scotland today. 
From the start, this has been an independently produced show and a passion project of mine. So if you enjoyed this episode and want to help us reach even more listeners, consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts today. I love reading your feedback and reviews really help others find the show. Wild for Scotland is part of the Tremula Network, adventure and outdoor podcasts off the beaten path. The show is written and hosted by me, Kathy Kamleitner. Thanks to Fran Tarowskis, who is a co-producer and editor and does the sound design. Kirsty Spain helps out with transcripts and social media. Podcast art is by Lizzie Von Knight, the Tartan Trailburner, and all original music is composed by Bruce Wallace. Until next time, when we travel to a different place in Scotland.